Lisa presenting her enormous and very wonderful work about uh, Chinese investments in South Africa, uh, especially in South Africa, looking at the special economic zones, looking at the communities and the workers within and around the special economic zones uh, in South Africa. So I welcome you. Started my discussion earlier on, on how we are investigating Chinese investment uh, into Africa and South Africa. And that is basically looking at how um, China is, has managed to get such incredible influence in organizations like the African Union um, and also um, in, uh, through the Forum on China-Africa uh, Cooperation. And this is largely, of course, also facilitated uh, through BRICS because South Africa, obviously, as the the smallest partner in BRICS punching way above its actual economic weights still um, is a major driver of this narrative of egalitarian uh, development, inclusive development, and how this will, will benefit Africa because it's a completely different way of providing uh, development assistance. It's completely separate and uh, transformatory in that it doesn't model in any way the uh, organization on uh, economic uh, cooperation and development and the, uh, the, uh, the DAC model that goes along with that. So there's no conditionalities around these, the, the loans and investments that come uh, from China through BRICS or FOCAC. And the idea behind pushing this line, I think is also feeding very much into the historical uh, past of Africa, bearing in mind that, that large parts of Africa uh, have been colonized, large parts of Africa have also been subject to um, structural adjustment programs to many loans with uh, very harsh conditionalities. So the whole notion of uh, in, in um, uh, international development assistance, which is a complete, um, complete opposite of uh, the the OEC DAC model of um, the IMF model of the World Bank model. That is actually what really brings um, the African state leaders into the to the camp in such a tight way, if I can put it that way. So with, with this comes the idea that um, in terms of, of how China does international development assistance, they use the term beyond aid because according to the Chinese rhetoric narrative on this, it's egalitarian, it, it follows um, communist slash socialist principles, um, it, um, comes with uh, no strings attached, uh, very little by way of um, oversight. So it's up to each country involved to, to take care of that oversight um, and to make sure that the money is spent effectively. And for, for most um, African state leaders, this sounds great. And the kind of funding that's been pumped into Africa through FOCAC, through BRICS, um, and through the bilateral relations that China has been forming with key states in Africa, uh, there's been a steady uh, um, exponential increase in Chinese influence throughout the continent. Um, of course, this uh, increase is also linked to Belt and the Belt and Road Initiative, the Eurasian uh, African Belt and Road Initiative. So the whole idea of um, going out, the foreign policy of going out is also linked then to providing these types of um, assistance, not called aid, that will enable for a rewiring of trade flows from the global north, which has been seen as very problematic in Africa. And many of us have analyzed this as, as left-wing scholars and activists, the issue of, of, of the extractivism that goes from north, from south to north. And so the geostrategic recreation of the global south together with belt and road forms 
in, in Bricks and Focac, a very powerful light motif of how to rewire trade towards the global benevolent South hegemon, which is uh, China. And this would be um, facilitated through Bel Belt and Road. And the win-win mutual benefit is that China and Africa, through these bilateral relations and through the funding pledges from FOCAC and BRICS, are able to build infrastructure. They're able to build uh, industrial development parks. They're able to build special economic zones. And so my interest also uh, in and now, and now completely kind of down the rabbit hole fixation with special economic zones has got to do with how tightly special economic zones are tied into the Belt and Road Initiative and also how tightly they are tied into international development assistance or, or beyond aid. Um, so, so before I get onto the case studies from South Africa, I just wanted to point out that um, there are th three uh, key examples of where China, uh, Africa bilateral investments have shown to be very problematic in terms of the uh, both the type of uh, cooperation rewards from the cooperation in terms of how they boost development and what they do financially to the countries who've taken on these projects as a uh, bilateral uh, project in, uh, um, agreement um, between China and the state concerned. So I wanted to just briefly refer to Ethiopia, to Kenya and to South Africa. Uh, the the uh, cases of Ethiopia and Kenya are perhaps the most revealing because in South Africa, we have one example of a special economic zone that's up and running with a large amount of Chinese people invested in it. But to date, the, the zone that we are busy um, working to try to um, at least change, if not stop, uh, is in the final rounds of the final EIA. So that's work that I've been doing recently. Um, I will talk about that a little bit more in, in, a, minute, in a minute, but just to emphasize um, the real concerns around these types of investments in other African countries. We all, of course, know the, 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 the the case of um, China taking over the Sri Lanka port of Havantota. So that's a well-known one. But there's, there's an, an awful amount of, the only thing I can call it really is propaganda on how well the countries in Africa benefit from these large scale projects and how much of that is actually really just very good media propaganda. So let's take the, the, the case of the Addis to Djibouti line. Now, the Addis to Djibouti line co has cost in the region of about 50 billion. Um, so it went a bit over budget, quite how over budget, we don't know because we have similar issues and concerns that were raised by Maria Lena, which is around, um, and also um, Anna about, you know, where are these letters of agreement or, or contracts of agreements signed around particular facts, who gets to do any oversight, who, where is the accountability? We, in South Africa, we have massive problems with this. And from what I'm seeing out of the Ethiopian and the Kenyan case, it's exactly the same problem. A complete lack of transparency and accountability around how the loans are um, set up, what the conditionalities are, um, the, the terms are all keep, kept very opaque. Um, we know, for example, that with the the, the, the reason now that the, the Addis Djibouti line is creating less um, distress, economic distress, is because China was forced a couple of years ago to double the uh, repayment time from 15 years to 30 years. So it's gone from being, from being a major crisis to a fairly minor crisis. But um, that's in itself doesn't uh, get away from some other very big issues. The line was built with money from Exum um, and about 70% of the loan came from Exum, 30% came from, from the Ethiopian government. I'm not entirely sure exactly how they put together that 30%, but those are the figures in the public domain. Uh, of the, in the agreement, it was stated that there would be large scale job creation for locals. And the point of, uh, the, the the route is not only because it would be 
part of Belt and Road, and so evidently strategic to China because it would link um, Addis to as a major trading partner. It would link Addis to Djibouti, also a major, major trading partner, and of course an incredibly geostrategically important port. Port. Um, so. Um, the, the, the line was created around also uh, setting up industrial development zones along, there are nine so-called industrial development zones along the line. Currently, as far as I can glean uh, with the, the digging I've done so far, not doing very well, not very functional, basically because the Addis Djibouti line itself is a deeply dysfunctional railway line. It First of all, they didn't even finish it to get it right down to the Djibouti port. So it ends some kilometers before the Djibouti port, and then the trucks still have to come in to pick up the goods to take them to the Djibouti port. So that's already a, a flaw which has been acknowledged. Another major one is that the, the actual railway station for the line, is, which is supposed to be a cheap alternative also for uh, transport between Addis and Djibouti, is set some um, 90 kilometers out of the main suburban area um, of Addis. So in order to get to the line, you have to pay as much to get to the line as you do for the ticket to get on the train. And then and, and yet another issue is that the line is, um, this is what I hear directly from a cultural attache uh, based um, at one of the embassies there, is that there are structural issues with the line it, it doesn't function properly, and so the, the speed of the line has been affected, um, and um, it doesn't work all the time. I, I googled an article uh, to find out about passengers taking the train, and there was a, a letter from an, an, an Ethiopian, an, uh, an anonymous letter from an Ethiopian, just explaining how he eventually decided he wasn't going to catch this train, because well, he couldn't catch the train. By the time he got to the train station 90 minutes out of the central uh, business area, the train had was not working for two weeks. So that's the sort of functionality of the 50 billion, go watch the, the, the glorious um, videos, you know, made by uh, the Chinese propaganda machine, no doubt, about how wonderful this railway line is, just to see the huge gap between the, uh, the social media hype and the actual reality. Um, and a similar um, leitmotif runs through the question of the Nairobi uh, to Mombasa line. Again, a line linking a major city to a major port. Um, this line uh, was constructed again with around the figure of roughly about 50 billion. It's hard to tell about the overspend because you, you've got to dig through a whole lot of Chinese propaganda to find it, but there certainly seems to have been some overspend and some corruption with this one um, around the payment of key officials in um, orchestrating the management of the zone. Um, but those are hard to corroborate. So I just man, man, uh, man, uh, mentioned that anecdotally. Um, the line is largely functional, um, but however, it so far it has put the Kenyan government into a financial crisis of immense proportions. So at present, the, um, the uh, Kenyan government has had all loans from China suspended. And there's a lot of argument, legal arguments going on now about the contract, which still is yet to see the light of day. The president has promised to put it out there into the public domain and it just never reaches the public domain. Uh, so where Ke the Kenyan government is now is after a lot of um, wriggling and writhing to get out of a contractual obligation that evidently is there, the, um, the whole question of repayment and the whole question of the port as collateral, which is, according to the document that nobody's ever seen, built in as collateral, it now has to go to a Chinese arbitration um, court, after which the decision around whether the port goes to China will be taken as irrevocable. Now, given the, the sensitivities around the port takeovers, it will be very interesting to see what happens, whether China does then make good on the contractual obligation or another deal is made like they did with Ethiopia to extend the 
long term. But these are, I think, two classic examples of um, huge problems with loans to Africa made the Chinese way, made the um, way of international development assistance, this, this um, glorious new beyond aid uh, type of aid offered by China that is so different from, from Northern aid. So those are just the two railways. And then um, this is the Messina Mercado Special Economic Zone, which is uh, the proposed economic zone for the uh, Limpopo area of South Africa. Um, the Limpopo province is based very close to the bike bridge border, in other words, to Zimbabwe. And it is also closely interlocked with other Southern African countries with um, shared borders and shared um, water um, agreements, um, international water agreements. Um, so the, the, the importance of this special economic zone uh, is linked also to how China has grown this um, ideology of equal development and um, promoting Belt and Road Initiative, promoting the special economic zones, because South Africa is in the middle of uh, a, a major just transition debate with some very strong environmental uh, groups, social movements, working very hard, trying to put a lot of pressure on um, my uh, uh, funder, who's fund the, the Messina Mercado Special Economic Zone work, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, have been working very hard to um, push this just transition towards a more low carbon economy. And at the same time, we have the dystopian um, reality of Cyril Ramaphosa coming back from uh, the FOCAC summit in, in uh, um, in Beijing in 2018, uh, just you know, fanfaring the Messina Mercado Special Economic Zone as the new mega project that was going to turn the South African economy around. It's going to be eventually a smart city and it's going to link up to um, all the other special economic zones in ways that haven't really been explained explicitly. But the bottom line is that the special economic zone has gotten an enormous amount of um, support and endorsement from the presidency, national government, our national department of uh, trade, industry and competition, um, from even the department of water affairs um, and the Enabling agencies, interestingly enough, and this goes to what Maria Elena was saying, the enabling agencies in this particular zone are uh, two agencies, one based at local level called the Limpopo Economic Development Agency, and the other one called LIDET, which is the Limpopo Economic Development and Environmental and Tourism Agency. And one is, as I said, local, one is provincial. They are actually overseeing the process of this first EIA, which is ap apparently for land clearing. But what all the environmental groups and activists um, uh, who have been working on the zone are concerned about is that this is a kind of a foot in the door approach. So get the land clearing done first. An 8,000 hectare uh, project was now being scaled down, we're told, to 3,300 hectares. Um, but at the center of this, of this extractive metallurgical zone is going to be a coal plant, which was initially going to be a 4,600 megawatt coal plant. Then after a lot of um, uh, bad press, um, which I'm very happy to say my activist group at Accede and through FES um, have been very uh, happy to to add to. So we've been publishing a lot in the Mail and Guardian. And if you're interested in finding out all the dirty business around trying to get the Messina Mercado SEZ through, then do go and Google. I'll put it in the chat later. Um, Mail and Guardian Messina Mercado SEZ, and you'll see a lot of uh, stuff comes up right going back to 2019, and also to uh, some articles that I wrote together 
with Eric Toussaint and um, with Patrick Bond um, and I think Mishak Mapungula from Mining Affected Communities Unite and Action was also involved in those earlier publications. So basically, with a lot of pressure, um, we've managed to uh, push both um, the Chinese investors who are behind the zone, um, as well as government to reduce the footprint of the zone. But the bottom line is that it's still sending around a 1,320 uh, 1, megawatt coal plant, which again, that's supposed to be for a future EIA, but we don't know at the, at the present moment whether that's um, commitment to the size of the, the coal plant would not be changed at some point. Um, and we've had a number of engagements, myself um, and my colleague from Frederick Ebert Stiftung um, have done an interview with the head of the Limpopo Economic Development Agency, the CEO. And he was quite unapologetic about the coal plant because according to him, they are going to use uh, ultra super critical clean coal technologies with uh, closed carbon sequestration. So we don't need to worry because this is going to be a clean coal project. And what is extremely um, funny in a very sort of dark humor kind of way is that we have our, our two major power plants in South Africa that were supposed to get us out of trouble, funded by the World Bank with Madupi Power Plant and Kusili Power Plant. And Madupi is the largest power plant, I think, in Africa. I'm not mistaken, I'm sure it's the largest one, which has been running at um, less than, than capacity. It was supposed to be finished in 2015, and it's only sort of nominally been finished this year. Uh, just after the, the good press about that it had been released, um, they had a major blow up and fire there, and it's now sort of got to, going to take another eight billion to fix. And Madupi was signed into the World Bank contract that Madupi was supposed to have ultra super critical clean coal, um, which it doesn't have, and it says it can't afford. So, you know, our track record in South Africa for keeping promises, even ones written into, contra into World Bank contracts, isn't very good. So you can imagine the concern of the environmental groups and the um, activists working on this around these promises and around the fact that um, with absolute impunity, we are told in the master plan for the messina Makada zone that 70% of the, the um, products that will be um, um, I'm not sure how much beneficiation will even happen, but of the extractivist industries that will be built there, 70% of those are destined for China. So, you know, the whole theory around this SEZs are based on the Shenzhen model are that it enables a country to grow its own local economy by the diversification of, um, of um, the economy by value chains, the creation of value chains, by the creation of local jobs. And here we see very little by way of beneficiation. Uh, we see um, a project which appears to be, um, to be a largely Chinese run project because it's all around high tech um, industry. Um, in the middle of a biosphere, the Vembe biosphere, which is a water scarce area anyway. And the, the ways in which government at all levels have been trying to convince uh, civil society and activist groups that um, this MMSEZ should go ahead, that they're making plans, they, they're gonna build a, an enormous, another mega dam on the Limpopo River uh, to feed the water to the zone, they're going to extract groundwater at an alarming rate of how many million um, 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 cubic meters per, we're still trying to work that one out, whether it's seconds or, or, or um, per annum, but um, the fact is that they are planning on really uh, draining the, 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 the um, groundwater system in an area where there's, there's ongoing droughts, and there just seems to be so little sense in this project. Yes, on the 1st of September this year, 2021, Cyril Ramaphosa hosted an investor conference for the zone. Um, Anglo-American pledged uh, about uh, 275 million, which is um, 
I think it's about 17 million US dollars to the zone. There's already the 27 billion promised by the Chinese, and that's without, um, I think that's just for the startup costs, they've promised more. Um, so they're throwing figures at uh, communities uh, at, uh, you know, just at an scary uh, rates. Also doubling um, the, um, the employment figures. I'm gonna stop after this so we can have more discussion, but the employment figures have gone from 100, 000, from 20,000 in the beginning to 53,000 in April, May to 100,000 now. So communities we, that we've been working with, we've just done a, a round of community engagement have told us, first of all, they, they don't really know if they even understand what a special economic zone is. The whole public participation pro process has been hilariously badly run. Um, and, and, and what's happening is that those communities that government has managed to buy in, um, and there are a, a number of communities that um, they have bought in, are saying yes to the zone on the basis of these massive job uh, promises. Uh, so. I'm, um, you know, wanting just to end on 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 the the, the point that there's been a discussion and a, and a debate um, in South Africa and um, in Africa generally, with some left of center academics and activists saying, oh, this Chinese dip diplomacy thing is really just, um, you know, it's it's just not really understanding how the Chinese work." But if we look at the facts and the figures and, and, and we take actual case study examples, and this is basically what I'm wanting to do in, in the book that I'm releasing, is to say, yes, well, there is a benefit to the way that China, China operates, but there's also a very uh, dark side to it. And the lack of accountability and transparency is the part that is deeply concerning. I mean, we're talking about the lack of transparency and accountability in a country that's supposed to be a democracy. So, you know, that concerns me because there are many other countries in Africa that are very nominally democratic, at least where, you know, I'd say somewhat as opposed to nominally, um, although that might be arguable as well. But um, the point of the matter is that the zone uh, is the reach of China into South Africa as part of Belt and Road and everything about the zone just seems to indicate a development disaster waiting to happen. So I'll stop there.